Toba's greetings. I'm your host, Dr. Wolfielan. When I'm not choosing to continue employing my terrible security guard just because he looks like LL Cool J, I'm here at the Wolfielan reviewing movies. Let's continue our October 2021 revisiting the Halloween franchise with my review of Halloween H2O, 20 years later, released in 1998. Halloween The Curse of Michael Myers was a modest success in 1995 despite being poorly received by most fans. So then series producer the late Mustafa Akkad decided to continue on with another sequel right away. Halloween 7 would take things in new directions, not only creatively, but also distribution and budget-wise. Halloween 7 would be the first direct-to-video film in the series, a grim fate for any horror franchise, and have a lower budget than the series' standard $5 million. It made perfect sense initially. The horror genre had fallen out of favor quite a bit by the mid-90s, and the burgeoning home video market became a new avenue for the typically low-budget genre to thrive in, financially at least. Very early on, it was decided that Halloween 7 would be a fresh start. There was no desire to continue the storyline of what would be dubbed retroactively by fans as the Thorn Trilogy. I can't blame them. There were far too many hanging plot threads and ambiguities in Halloween 6's theatrical ending, and unless Paul Rudd signed a contract to do sequels ahead of time, there was absolutely no way he'd return for Halloween 7. The man worked with Alicia Silver Silverstone, for God's sake. Robert Zappia took on writing duties for the seventh Halloween film, tentatively titled Two Faces of Evil, with the plot involving Michael stalking some totally new relative of his, who's a student at an all-girls boarding school. Hey, just because it's a new start for the Halloween franchise, that doesn't mean you can ever dare lose Michael killing his relatives. He absolutely has to be the familicide guy, no matter what. That's what we love most about him. The Two Faces of Evil script also featured a very original gimmick. The FBI would be pursuing Michael Myers with the help of a copycat killer, hence the Two Faces of Evil title. Basically, Silence of the Lambs with Michael Myers. Eh. Then everything changed when Dimension Films released Scream in 1996, which made nearly a quarter of a billion dollars and extensively referenced the original Halloween, giving the seventh Halloween potential to be a massive hit. So Dimension decided to make Halloween 7 a theatrical film with the largest budget the Halloween series has ever had. $17 million, which would be $28 million today. For reference, Halloween 2018 cost $10 million, so Dimension Films wasn't fucking around with Halloween 7. And to prove that further, the Weinsteins, with their infinite charm, convinced Jamie Lee Curtis to return as Laurie Strode for a 20th anniversary film. They even almost got John Carpenter back as director, but he asked for $10 million. So instead, they got Steve Miner, the affordable director of Friday the 13th Part 2 II and 3. But more importantly, he directed Soul Man, a film that didn't age well even when it was released. Go get my heroin and my hypodermic needle, bitch! Robert Zappia's script was retooled, the Hannibal Lecter ripoff shit was removed, and Laurie Strode was inserted into the boarding school setting. Kevin Williamson, creator of the Scream franchise, was brought aboard to do uncredited rewrites of Zappia's script, and finally given the title Halloween H2O 20 years later. So the full title would be Halloween, Halloween 20, 20 years later. I don't know who came up with this title, but they're a fucking genius. Seriously though, I think the title for H2O has been misinterpreted based on how its logo is awkwardly stylized on the poster and in the credits. I think the title is just supposed to be Halloween 20 years later. And the H2O part was just an artifact of the 90s trend of putting the abbreviation of a movie title into the movie's poster for marketing, like with Terminator 2, aka T2. It's just that Halloween 20 years later's logo confused everybody, and they thought you were supposed to say the H2O acronym as part of the full title instead of H2O just being a catchy marketing shorthand. For all intents and purposes, is though, the seventh Halloween movie is now stuck with a truly shitty title. Initially, H2O featured references to Laurie's daughter, Jamie Lloyd, but Laurie faking her death, going into hiding, and abandoning her firstborn to die in Haddonfield kind of makes her seem like the worst mother ever, so H2O just doesn't acknowledge the events of Halloween 4, 5, and 6. This was a controversial decision amongst fans, but was it worth it in the end? Is Halloween H2O a worthy successor to the original Halloween? Eh, not really. Really. Like Halloween 2, H2O opens with the cordette song Mr. Sandman. This is a hint to the film's function. The third part of a trilogy carrying on from Halloween 2 with the song that that film ended with. Bring me a dream. 
Whether or not you listen to H2O's subliminal message to treat it as the true Halloween 3 is another story entirely. H2O's cold opening begins in the aftermath of Dr. Loomis's death, a nice acknowledgement that H2O is the first Halloween movie without Pleasance's involvement. I'd also like to point out that, besides Halloween 3 of course, H2O is the only Halloween movie that doesn't take place in Haddonfield at all. Instead, the brief Illinois prologue takes place in the equally fictional town of Langdon. Nurse Marion Chambers, played by Nancy Stevens from Halloween 1 and 2, now lives in Loomis's old house, and because she didn't get rid of any of his shit, her home is a target of, you guessed it, Frank Stallone. Uh, I mean Michael Myers, resurfacing after 20 years. What's Michael been up to this whole time? Well, after being set on fire, Michael decided to make the most of his 20s and 30s. Settle down, raise some kids, found a job that paid well, but when he turned 41, he realized he wasn't where he wanted to be at this stage of his life, and decided to return to his true passion, butchering family members on Halloween. Okay, I'm giving this movie too much credit. Michael's absence just isn't addressed. He would require actually putting any thought into Michael Myers in this movie. Anything that's gonna... My house was broken into. Oh shit. No shit. Anyway, Nurse Chambers calls upon the help of future former famous actor Joseph Gordon-Levitt, cosplaying as a guy the director used to know, and the boy checks the old Loomis place for shapes, and Jimmy here does a thorough job, but he neglected to inspect his own home. <laughs> The first kill is with an ice skate off screen? Oh, this is gonna be good. <laughs> Two consecutive off screen kills. Yeah, this is really inspiring confidence in the next 80 minutes of this movie. Anyway, though, Nurse Chambers tries to alert the extremely late authorities investigating next door, but I'm afraid something gets caught in her throat. Well, luckily, she's gonna have a second chance to have a cooler death. Point is, Michael snooped around in Loomis's old office and retrieves a file revealing that his sister Lori didn't perish in a car accident after all. She faked her death and lives under an assumed identity in California. So this movie doesn't have to fake the West Coast for Illinois like usual. Looks like Michael's on his way to a family reunion, and he takes his fucking time to get there. Oh yeah, in the investigation of Loomis's office, the black detective is the English voice actor of Jet from Cowboy Bebop. I was 15 when he killed his sister back in 63. That's not the only voice actor in this movie though. The intro features now unfortunately retired voice actor Tom Kane, providing narration is Dr. Loomis. The blackest eyes. The devil's eyes. Performing Loomis's famous monologue because they couldn't isolate Pleasance's dialogue from the original movie. For the spawn of Satan, I must destroy you! <laughs> Loomis's physical absence is something H2O doesn't fully recover from and never figures out a response to. A character like Loomis gives a Halloween film a sense of direction and structure, bringing order that separates the series from other slasher films. Loomis's character and his performance and actions makes Michael seem like a larger-than-life threat, and without that, the shape becomes a mere shadow. Michael's gonna be driving for a while, so let's catch up with his baby sister Lori, now Carrie Tate. The headmistress of a prestigious private boarding high school, Hillcrest Academy in Summer Glen, California. <laughs> I know this might surprise you, but Carrie suffers from PTSD, following her encounter with her brother Michael 20 years prior. Tate has a son named John, played by the ever-charismatic Josh Hartnett in his feature film debut. Caffeine is not a food group. Rather perk it down. Carrie and John have a difficult relationship because she has forced her son to live this sheltered life, isolated within a private school, and this makes John act up out of rebellion. He's an anti-Laurie Strode. What the what do you think you're doing? Well, I'm really uncomfortable with you saying that Well, word. then don't put me in the position, John. It's a relationship dynamic with potential, but it doesn't lead anywhere interesting. The sticking point between mother and son initially is that John isn't allowed to go on the Halloween camping trip to Yosemite, where he can spend time with his girlfriend, Molly. I'm not going. Yes, I am. No, you're not. But then it turns out that Molly can't go anyway. And the person's being such a dick, now I can't go to Yosemite. And by that point, Carrie allows John to go to Yosemite, but he decides not to go secretly. Can I go? I wouldn't say that. It's basically just an excuse for the Academy to be empty by the time Michael actually arrives. Having the movie take place up in the mountains would be fucking cool, so of course they have to make it take place in a school instead. Josh Hartnett's inclusion is a disappointing follow-up to Laurie's original kid, Jamie Lloyd. He's just not interesting. The teens in the movie were originally the focus before Jamie Lee Curtis was cast, but in the actual film, the teens are there just to appeal to the audience for Scream movies, to the point where Scream 
Scream 2 is shown on the girl's TV. Which makes no fucking sense because Halloween is a movie in the Scream universe. It was in the first fucking movie! John's and Molly's friends are another couple, the chick from Prison Break, and the dude that played Robin Williams as a kid in Jumanji. Their entire defining character traits are that they're constantly horny. They have a roaming orgy. <laughs> the way this man thinks! So of course they're going to survive this fucking movie. Even the horny characters in Friday the 13th movies are more subtle than these two. Animal sex. Here's a little extra trivia about the Charlie character. The film's original twist was that it would be revealed that the killer of the movie would be Charlie as a copycat Michael Myers, and eventually the real Michael Myers would be drawn out of hiding and kill Charlie. Yeah, they kept the copycat killer element in the screenplay until the very last minute, but thankfully they got rid of it eventually because that's the kind of twist that only a screenwriter would think is cool. Film viewers tend to not enjoy being jerked around, and H2O jerks us around enough as it is. Hi. Another cast member of actual note is, uh, LL Cool J as Ronnie, Hillcrest security guard. I don't want a baby before I get so old I can't get my butt back. You gotta give me a chance, honey. I have to express myself creatively. LL Cool J's inclusion wouldn't be the last stunt casting of a rapper the series would see, but the reason why LL Cool J is in the movie is because Dimension Films found that the Halloween series has a big African-American fan base, and casting one of the most influential rappers in music history would generate some more ticket sales. Makes sense, but Ronnie the security guard feels like a last minute inclusion. He's just kind of off to the side, and it's a strange choice to make this cool rapper play this kind of lame, bumbling, comic relief security guard. Hey. What, what, what's going on, baby? I don't know. The movie extensively documents Ronnie workshopping a smutty romance novel over the phone with his sassy wife. I want to tantalize myself with your sweet nectar. Tanya, better not fuck with that shit. I smell that a mile away. The inclusion is bizarre, inorganic, and adds nothing of value to the movie. In other words, it's right at home in Halloween H2O. Some more trivia. Jamie Lee Curtis wanted to get another weird celebrity cameo in H2O. When Carrie thinks she sees Michael Myers in a window reflection in town, it would be revealed to actually be the comedian Mike Myers. Get it? Both of them would do a double take and Mike Myers would just walk away. I am not kidding. This is too stupid to make up. The focus of H2O is on Jamie Lee Curtis Ultimately, the film essentially became a star vehicle for her when she signed on, an opportunity to put her name out there again, top build, and to capitalize on the renewed popularity of horror films. H2O also acts as a tribute to Curtis's family, as her mother, the late Janet Lee, not only has a cameo, but her car from Psycho appears, complete with her theme from the film. It's Halloween, I guess everyone is entitled to one good scare. <sighs> H2O extensively explores Carrie's PTSD, and it adds pathos and a new layer of dimension to the survivor girl archetype. I've tried everything. I really have. I've tried everything. What happens to a survivor of a masked killer years after they survived? Did a part of Lori Strode still die on that Halloween night? Can it be reclaimed? It's a really good character hook. Carrie's past impacts her relationships with her son, and a burgeoning relationship with Alan Arkin's less famous son. But you know, it could be worse. Adam Arkin could be Matthew Arkin. I'm a really good listener. The concept behind Carrie Tate's character is a cool idea, but she lives a cloistered life. Seeing the lifestyle of a wine mom school teacher isn't exactly enthralling to witness in a horror movie, and it's what the movie is mostly about for nearly an hour. Remember, Michael Myers has to take a 30-hour drive to get to his sister. It's a fatal mistake this movie makes. In the original Halloween, once Michael escapes, he's already in Haddonfield stalking Laurie and building suspense. You know a killer is around. It's scary. It's interesting. Meanwhile, in H2O, suspense has to be generated artificially, with Lori hallucinating seeing her brother Michael, but worst of all is the jump scares. Oh! Oh! oh. Damn it! The fucking jump scares in this movie, man. I counted at least ten jump scares in this film that are total fakeouts. Oh, fuck me! Shit! What? It's one thing to heavily rely on jump scares, it's another thing to have no follow-through. You just fucking with the audience for an hour. They see it coming, it gets old real quick. No!
The film attempts to inject some suspense in the middle by having the rest stop scene where Michael's first car has a flat, and he encounters a female motorist and her young daughter, but this scene is a cheap way to build suspense and pad the film out. It's arbitrary. Michael getting a flat tire along the way to his destination has no impact on the plot. You could easily cut this scene out and just have Michael drive one car all the way there, but the other issue is it's just an easy way to make a scene suspenseful instantly by putting a little girl in. You don't have to build a character up because most of the audience is just not gonna want to see a little kid murder to begin with. Mom, that's the boys' world. The boys are just gonna have to deal with it. It's especially upsetting when Michael does viciously murder that little girl. It's crazy, the most gruesome death in the movie against a little girl. But I can't show it because this is YouTube after all. That child's death is fucking brutal though. Let's finally talk more about Michael Myers, played by Chris Durand, a return of a skinny shape, like the original Nick Castle portrayal. And he does a good job replicating Castle's body language as Michael Myers, but this is offset by how fucking goofy Michael Myers looks in this movie. And there was a whole lot of controversy behind the scenes that contributed to this. Halloween H2O's first Myers mask, made by K&B FX Group, was initially whatever the fuck this is. Michael Myers looks like an angry white thumb with hair. It looks like the shitty Michael Myers mask you see at Party City. This is the mask the director Steve Miner chose, and he fought to keep the mask in the movie, but the producers were just like, you're fucking insane, Steve. So briefly, they involved John Carl Beekler and had him produce a slightly modified version of the mask he made for Halloween 6, which is briefly visible in the movie, but Steve Miner didn't like that mask, so they had to compromise by having Stan Winston make a mask that pleased the producers and the director, which is the main mask seen in the movie, looking to me like they literally made a mask of Mike Myers face. Like whoever made it took making a Mike Myers mask way too literally. The main issue was the mask is molded too tightly. Part of what made the original Michael Myers look work is that Nick Castle had a thin face and the mask was loose so you could instantly read it as a mask no matter the lighting and it made it so Castle's eyes were almost never visible. In H2O, because the mask is so tight, it doesn't look like a mask, it looks like Michael's just wearing face paint and you could always see Michael's eyes which makes him more human, but also leads to unintentional comedy when Michael makes a visibly humorous, bug-eyed look. The worst part about all of this, though, is that they shot a few weeks' worth of footage for this movie with the original thumb-like mask, so they had to spend millions of dollars reshooting those scenes with the better but still shitty mask, but the original mask is still visible in many shots. In fact, frequently the masks will change back and forth between shots within the same scene. Once you notice this, it can can't be unnoticed. <laughs> The absolute worst mask moment in the film doesn't even involve a real mask. When Charlie meets Michael Myers for the first time, he's greeted by Michael wearing an obviously CGI mask. It's the kind of graphics you'd see in GoldenEye on N64. Now, you might be wondering why the mask is CGI. Why didn't they just reshoot the scene like they did with the rest of the movie? Well, there's not a clear answer. According to the cinematographer Darren Okada, the set they shot this scene on was already broken down, so they couldn't go back there to reshoot it. But that doesn't really make sense, because the shot is flat against a wall. They could easily fake an insert shot. It's possible they were just lazy and didn't feel like reshooting this one shot and just tried to fix it in a computer. What might have really happened, though, is that they were originally going to try to fix all the shots of the original mask with CGI enhancements, and this was the test shot, but they realized it was impractical, so they just went with reshoots and decided this test shot was good enough as CGI to keep in the film. Nobody's gonna notice. It's fucking seamless. <laughs> The other notable oddity with the production of this movie that stands out is the score. John Ottman, a composer and editor of the X-Men series and a lot of other Brian Singer films, yikes, is credited for H2O's music, but a lot of his music isn't actually in the movie. H2O was originally edited with a temp track featuring music by Marco Beltrami from the Scream movies. <laughs> But when John Ottman finally scored H2O, everyone hated most of his music, which had this strange, whimsical quality that was overly complex. Uh... 
It sounded like Danny Elfman music and not a Halloween score. John Ottman's score is only heard for the opening of the movie and usually brief transitions between scenes or as ambiance. The majority of the music in H2O was just recycled from the Scream movies. They even reused John Carpenter's version of the Halloween theme at the end. Man, even the story behind the music in this movie is a mess. So Halloween H2O doesn't have much suspense, Michael Myers is a joke, and it doesn't even have that many kills. But what's there towards the end is adequate. Charlie has a long-winded scene where he's grabbing a corkscrew in a garbage disposal. Now, Jamie Lee Curtis actually really wanted Charlie's hand to get chewed up in the garbage disposal, but the director, Steve Miner, didn't want to do it and wanted the scene to just subvert expectations. So instead, Charlie is killed off screen. You know, for being the only guy who's directed two Friday the 13th movies, Steve Miner really didn't push for much gore in this Halloween movie. There is some redemption with Sarah's death because, for whatever reason, Michael really goes to town on this bitch, stabbing her in the dumbwaiter and eventually crushing her leg with said dumbwaiter. It's a gruesome scene that always makes me cringe. It just seems like it'd be an insanely painful thing to endure. I should do that to goulash. <laughs> Michael ends up killing Sarah off screen, but it's eventually revealed that Michael, just for effect, turned Sarah into a human lampshade. Savage as fuck! This moment is so out of place with the rest of the film, but I love it. Especially since it's followed by a goofy scene where John and Molly are trapped between two doors with Michael trying to stab at them, and eventually he awkwardly fumbles with some keys. It's like an SNL parody of a Halloween movie. <laughs> well, anyway, Carrie Tate's boyfriend heroically kills Michael Myers. Uh-oh. He really fucked up. Michael Myers is a huge LL Cool J fan. Michael said knock you out! Ugh! After Carrie gets rid of her idiot son and his bimbo girlfriend, the movie shifts gears into something a little bit more watchable. Michael! Laurie Strode finally facing her brother head on instead of running. The final act is fun overall, though some moments make it feel like if Spielberg directed a Halloween movie. With dopey scenes like Laurie hiding under tables, wasn't her plan to fucking kill this guy? Why is she hiding now? Eventually though, after all the various shenanigans, Laurie Strode Strode stabs Michael six times, stabs him in the heart, but this time there'll be no disappearing act. Except LL Cool J comes back to life because he doesn't want Laurie killing one of his most loyal fans. Laurie isn't letting this motherfucker pull a fast one though, slinking out of the morgue when nobody's looking. She's all about that thug life after all. And after totaling an ambulance she can't afford to replace on a teacher's salary, even a fancy white people school teacher's salary, she has a moment of sentimentality for the brother she never knew. A missing piece of her life she can never fit back into place. But ultimately when all is said and done, nobody's gonna pass up the opportunity to decapitate a guy. Hell yeah! Now, originally, series producer Mustafa Akkad refused to allow this to be the ending. In his contract, he stipulated that Michael Myers can never have a definitive death in any Halloween movie, so the series could continue forever. This was a point of contention for Jamie Lee Curtis, who was ready to quit the film before shooting started, unless she would be able to kill Michael herself. So Kevin Williamson came up with an idea to make both Curtis and Akkad happy. It looks like Michael Myers is killed in H2O, and it works as a satisfying ending, but the next movie would reveal what really happened. I'll get into that in the next vid, but it's a stupid explanation that ruins H2O's ending. Halloween H2O, 20 years later, is a middle-of-the-road sequel. It's got some good stuff in it, but it also has bad stuff that really holds it back. When it first came out, it was hailed as the best Halloween sequel ever, but in retrospect, it's far from even that. H2O had a lot of the right ingredients, but it's like somebody pissed in the recipe. It misses the mark on Michael Myers more than any of the previous films, and this guy is the bread and butter of the series. Bringing back Laurie was great, Jamie Lee Curtis is fantastic, but you can't treat this like a Marvel film where you have a great hero, but the villain sucks. The villain has to be great in a horror movie, otherwise you don't have much of a horror movie. Just a really slick looking thriller starring the chick from True Lies. Halloween H2O isn't bad though, it's just disappointing. 
disappointing, and that hurts a lot more than if it was just a bad movie. To see the potential put to waste, I give Halloween H2O, 20 years later, a bad Michael Myers mask out of a CGI Michael Myers mask. Join me next time on October as I revisit Halloween Resurrection, featuring the finest performance of Buster Rhymes' acting career. See you there. This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out.